Thank you. Phyllis, please. Well, first of all, I want to add uh, my gratitude to Judy and King for uh, organizing a spectacular meeting. I wish I could have been to every single session, but instead I heard a lot already from my colleagues who were able to attend the sessions that this was thought-provoking, this was uh, stimulating, this was challenging and very fulfilling all at once. And then secondly, I want to thank all of you for coming and adding to the conversation, to the discussion. Your wisdom will benefit everyone who is here, particularly those of us on the UW campus who really, really benefit from the kind of exchange that has happened over the last couple of days. Um, I'm sure that there were many planned discussions in each of the sessions, but as important, I'm sure there were serendipitous conversations that one could never plan for that just happened because really smart, good, interested, intelligent people were put together in one place at one time. Um, I think I stand between you and a good glass of wine, so I'm going to try and make this short. Um, Judy asked me to talk about uh, global health from a university perspective. In some senses, um, Howie has already touched on that. So I'm just going to uh, go a little bit further and then um, release you to enjoy the last few hours of light today and hopefully enjoy a little bit of, of uh, Seattle. Uh, when I think about the university perspective and global health, it is, for me, the model that I use when I talk about the ultimate in interdisciplinarity. Because I do believe that global health, the word, is in fact too limiting. And that, I think, is what Howie touched upon. When we talk about truly solving the major challenges in global health, we are talking about energy, about uh, environmental sustainability, about urbanization, about transportation, about um, livable communities, about the built environment. And uh, one has the risk of becoming too diffuse when one tries to do as broad a question as this. But on the other hand, one is challenged to do interdisciplinary par excellence. So I think uh, this is a personification of virtually all of the big societal challenges today. That is, it demands a level of interdisciplinarity that we are not used to in the academy. That is to say, we are still organized in schools and colleges. Most of those schools and colleges are um, divided up into departments. Oftentimes, those departments are divided up into divisions, and sometimes those divisions are divided up into programs and tracks. And this is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing if we are really going to be able to train and teach the students who are going to be leaders in the next generation. It is exactly the opposite of the way we really need to help our faculty be interactive, to be able to go from the very fundamental principles of discovery all the way up to translation and policy. So what can we do as leaders in the academy to help to promote interdisciplinarity? Well, there are several mechanical things we can do, obviously. One is to promote dual appointments of faculty into two different departments. And appointing them is only the first step. Certainly the second step is mentoring them, making sure that they are promoted and tenured if you are on a tenure track position. Uh, we need to be able to figure out how to judge the scholarship and the contributions of these people because so often the departments to which they belong don't know how to judge the other aspect of their, um, their scholarship and their teaching. I think a second mechanism is to provide pilot funding to interdisciplinary topics which might not be of highest priority to any departmental chair, but um, must be of great importance to investment in at the university. A third mecha mechanism would be to do cluster hiring, and we certainly are trying to do that. That is to provide a new FTE, faculty FTE, to 
simultaneously to two or three or four different deans and ask them to work together to hire four people, three or four people at once who complement each other so that you can accelerate the attainment of critical mass in areas where uh, centers and programs could be funded. We oftentimes think about matching funds to allow um, the recruitment of a person that requires funding that is inadequate at the department or, or even school level so that we can, at the university level, enable that recruitment to take place. I think we definitely need to think about revisions to the criteria for promotion and tenure instead of just counting um, numbers of papers, numbers of meetings, even numbers of graduate students. How do we incentivize and reward people who are starting new companies, who are developing patents, who are licensing um, commercializable uh, ideas? How do we reward people who are not only partnering with people in other departments or other schools, but partnering with industry, partnering with NGOs, partnering with businesses, partnering with other institutions at a global level, which is clearly required for global health. I think these are just some of the things that are uh, challenges, I think, to the universities. We are um, known for being deliberate, for being um, consultative, almost uh, process paralyzed. And I think that in the world of today, when nimbleness, responsiveness, ability to change, ability to think out of the box is what is really valued for areas like global health. It becomes incumbent upon us to figure out incentives and rewards for those people who think in those kinds of ways. So um, with that, I, I want to end just by saying thank you very, very much for coming. We are all the richer for all of the wisdom that you have shared with us. And thank you again, Judy and King, for a marvelous two days.